in May 2007, when I was 50, I was diagnosed um, with a quite a large uh, breast cancer. And I decided to go and see someone from the Royal Marsden, who was just down the road from me in Harley Street, where I've been in practice um, for over 20 years. And uh, anyway, they just made sort of quite small of it when I was first diagnosed. Oh, no, you know, a little bit of radiotherapy, a bit of surgery, and you'll be fine. Just a lumpectomy. And if you've been down this road, you know that it gets worse and worse every meeting you have. You think, blimey, you know, I'm going to be at the funeral parlour by the end of the day. So anyway, I went to see this guy, and uh, of course I can't read a scan, but I can read faces. So I, I was laying there, and I saw his face was getting very, very sort of serious and everything. I was thinking, oh God, I wish I hadn't worn these white jeans to this appointment, you know. <laughs> and he said, and he looked at me at the end of it, he said, has anyone told you how big this thing is? I said, no. <laughs> and he said, it's at least three and a half, four centimetres. And I went, is that big? <laughs> well, in relation to what? You know, some things are three and a half and four centimetres and they're pretty small. <laughs> other, on the other hand, you wouldn't want it on the end of your nose, would you? <laughs> so he started quoting science to me. And he said, you can't cut corners with a thing like this. You've got to have chemo and it's going to be accelerated chemo and there's going to be two different kinds. Uh, first, we want to do a lymph node biopsy uh, to see if it spread anywhere, and then it's going to be a mastectomy with reconstruction and blah, blah, blah. And he said uh, he was getting very scientific about it all, and uh, I was trying to take a few notes. Always got notes with me. I don't use them anymore, but still. And, um, and at the end of it, I looked at him, and I said, um, after all this science he'd been quoting, I said, well, how did I get cancer? Because obviously I'm not a negative person. I'm really super fit. And uh, I have a very proactive lifestyle. You know, I'm meant to chief executives from some of the biggest international companies there are. So, you know, I'm not exactly faint-hearted. So how did I get cancer? And he went, roll of the dice. So I thought, you just lost me there, mate. So I walked out of there, and the best thing that I did through all of this, and we've heard it a few times now, is I thought, I didn't get this overnight. So I don't have to make any decisions today. I'm going to give myself a few weeks to think about this because I'm essentially a practical person. And I thought, I'm going to do a bit of research into this. And I did. And I went to, I interviewed several surgeons at several different hospitals because I thought, I'm going to find the right person for me. At the same time, my poor GP, who had only been in practice about three or four years at the time, was getting very worried, although he didn't blame me for not going along with it. And he said, um, oh, he said, all right, I'll write another letter for you. He said, but oh, for God's sake, don't leave it too long. Will you hurry up and do something? And I said, oh, all right, yeah, chill. <laughs> <laughs> when I've decided, I didn't have enough information to make a decision. And if you don't have enough information, there's no point in making a decision. Now, the military have a saying, and I, I really like the way the military operate because... I'm practical in the same way, and they say the first thing you do, no matter how serious the situation is, no matter how urgent it is, you appreciate the situation. And that makes sense to me, because what that basically means is first, just take account of the facts. And to me, that's how you keep positive. You can't be all happy, lovely, and in denial all the time, because that's just a nonsense. And when you've just been told you've got cancer, how the hell are you going to start being positive and feeling happy? But if you keep focused on the facts and you have a plan, it doesn't matter what your feelings are. That's why the military teach discipline. Because if they relied on courage, the, the front line would probably have one person left when the big bang went off. So they don't. They teach discipline. Well, if you discipline yourself, it doesn't really matter what you feel like. You go through the motions. If you've got a good plan every day, you know what you're going to do and why you're going to do it. And so it's really important that you ask questions. And so I did, and I made my plan, and I did eventually find a lovely consultant. But the interesting thing, I mean, it's all sort of interesting, but to be honest, I mean, I didn't do anything on belief, absolutely nothing, because it's just not the way that I operate. That to me, it was quite a simple, practical sort of decision. I had one decision to make, really. If I didn't know if I was going to die or not, 
nobody does, who cares? We all get there in the end, so it doesn't really make any odds when you get there. It's how you get there, as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, I'd rather go and get lay down in the street than go through some of the processes that I was offered. And so it seemed to me I had a, a very simple choice to make, that if I was going to live, do I want to live being disabled with the damage that will be done to me with the treatment that I was going to have, assuming that I survived the treatment, and I was pretty certain that I wouldn't survive it. Intuitively, I knew from the dreams I was having I wasn't going to survive the treatment. And so the answer to that for me was, no, I'm not prepared to live as a disabled person. That's for me, personally. I've got no dependence or anything like that, and I, I was not going to live like that. And the other one was, well, if I'm going to die, do I want to spend the last 18 months or so of my life in and out of hospitals? And the answer to that was no. So it was a very simple decision. Not an easy one, but a very simple one. And so then I found the next thing that I did, and, and it, it is a way to keep focus, is actions speak louder than words. So words don't really count for anything in the end. I made a decision to recover, not to survive, to recover, because I'm not interested in survival. Survival just means sort of you made it by the skin of your teeth, as far as I'm concerned. So I decided to recover, and then I behaved accordingly, like someone who was going to recover. Now, at first, I didn't cancel everything out. I thought, being practical, I'd rather get this thing out my chest and do the clear up afterwards. And, I, and all of my alternatives are also medics because I like people with a foot in both worlds because I prefer people that know how to read scans, etc. So I thought, well, I'm going to make my body as anti anti cancer as possible before, at first, they were going to do a lumpectomy because, although it's a huge tumour, because I'm very fit and everything's in the right place, as they told me, I was a surgeon's dream. And it was right on the outside, so they could remove it relatively easily, but still with a lot of reconstruction. Where they're going to take it from, you don't want to know, I'll tell you. But um, anyway, I'll be scratching one place if I've got an itch somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> so I went very strict on the diet. And this, this thing was hard, and it was really calcified. It was like a cuttlefish, the size and shape of a cuttlefish. Well, within three weeks, it just collapsed down to jelly. So, of course, I nearly crapped myself. I thought, oh, my God, what's happened now? I phoned my alternative guy, and he said, well, that's the regime you've been on. It's supposed to happen. He said, but don't just rely on asking alternatives. He said, go to another hospital where they don't know you and get a scan. He said, so then you know f for sure, and you can see the scan. So I went to another hospital. I won't say where it was. And all of the medics I spoke to were all completely supportive and respectful of me, except for this one. And um, he started attacking me as soon as I got there and said, I don't know what you're here for anyway, because um, you know, you're obviously not going to have any treatment here and you're not going to survive. Well, I was keeping Sturm, which is not like me, because um, I decided I, I really wanted this scan. So I wanted to make sure I got that scan because that's why I was there. I'm very single-minded and focused when it comes down to it. So um, anyway, he kept telling me, he said, I've had nine other women like you think that they're going to do it alternatively or use integrated treatment, and they're all dead. And I thought, yeah, the way I feel right now, you're closer to death than I am. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I said nothing. <laughs> and I went in for my scan. And while I was being scanned, the ultrasound scan, and I said to the, the young man that was scanning me, I said, can you tell from a scan if a tumour is still invading or not? Because I was told by those in the know that when it goes soft, it stopped invading. And he said, um, you can see quite clearly there it's lying flat along the tissues. And he looked at me and he smiled. He said, that's a very good sign that your treatment's working. He said, it's completely inactive. I said, right. So uh, anyway, I ended up at another hospital. I left that one um, because um, he wasn't really my type. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think I was his. <laughs> and I've, I met the consultant that I've been with ever since who does all my blood tests, which are all completely v normal for ever since I've been having them for the last nearly six years now. And they're all on the very low end of normal. So how the hell I managed to get cancer, God only knows. According to my tests, I'm immortal. <laughs> Here I am. So you can't just rely on just tests, you know, because there's obviously other things going on. And also, they, I did have one surgery, wh which was a lymph node biopsy. And they found 
one cell in one lymph node, a little cluster of cells in another, and nothing in the rest of them. So, of course, I was told at the Marsden this was, <laughs> you know, we won't find any others in any other lymph nodes, but we want to take them all anyway. And I said, why? They said, because it's safe. I said, how? Because that interferes then with my immune system. Well, anyway, one thing led to another. I was still booked in for the surgery, but they were sweating by then. I said, oh, you know, you're going to have to have a mastectomy. It's all changed and all the rest of it. And I thought, oh, for God's sake, you know, it just gets worse every time. Anyway, they wrote to my doctor and said I was very happy to have all of my lymph nodes under my arm removed at the same time. Well, I phoned them up. I said, I didn't say that at all. And I said, I don't know enough yet to make a decision about the lymph nodes. So again, I went to the other hospital and he said, oh, you're lymph positive. You've got to have all your lymph nodes out. It's the only way to do it. And I thought, well, there's it, not a lot of common sense going on here because, again, you know, I'm, a, I'm a practical, common sense person. I always believe first look for the bleeding obvious. And no one could give me what I considered, scientific or otherwise, a reasonable explanation as to why I should go down that road. When I went to the final consultant, he just listened to me. I had all my paperwork with me, so you must keep all your paperwork. I had it all with me. And he said, um, he just listened. He said, just tell me how you got here. And I told him. And I know I didn't say on the bus. <laughs> and um, at the end of it, he said to me, well, I don't know whether you'll survive or whether you'll succumb, because only time will tell that, which was fair enough. He said, but I can tell you, at this moment in time, you're not in an immediately urgent situation. I said, OK. He said, as for the lymph nodes, he said, I've done the biggest lymph node trial in existence, to my knowledge. I've done over a 1,000 surgeries so far, and I've never found any more in people that have the result that you had, because we don't really know how they get there in that particular way. And he said, and I agree with you, we shouldn't remove any more of your lymph nodes because it's not safe. He said, however, we should remember that the enemy has visited. The best thing that I did was to take that time out and to question people and really question people. And if you're not sure, just don't make a decision on it. Just wait until you are sure about what you're going to do. Because of it, and this is not a plug, I wrote a book, the one that I was looking for when I was diagnosed. Because, again, being practical, I wrote just a 10-chapter book and there's 10 steps with each chapter. Because when you're first diagnosed, you're physically unable to think straight because you're in a state of shock. And yet we're expected to make some very complex and critical decisions when we are least able to do it. And so I wrote it in such a way that it's just like a manual and there's even a couple of chapters in there for your friends and family as well to tell them what not to say or how they can best help. I did find that I, I because I have such a tunnel vision about it, um, you've really got to stick to your guns. And so I did have to ban my family from speaking to me about the, the decisions I was making. I have become very like tunnel vision with it and you have to be quite determined like that. And I always measure it. You don't like to say things to people like, you know, you're really getting me down or I don't really want to talk to you about that or, or sod off. But you get to a point, I know they say, well, cancer people are nice. And I think, well, I'm not exactly backward in coming forward. But I must admit, I did put up with a lot. Coming from a big family, I always took the back seat in everything. And so I found that to be absolute tunnel vision, I simply measure it. Is this person, is this job, is this situation worth dying for? And I haven't found one yet that is. And so until now, I, I have no qualms about cutting them out. <laughs> Fiona said something really important to me, actually, when I first spoke to you on the, on the phone. I said, you know, I, I do feel a bit terrible about, you know, still being here, because I have no idea while I was still alive. I thought, what the hell's all that about, you know? And I said, you know, people I've known that have got children and everything, and they've left those behind, and I'm still around. Why? I could have gone. It wouldn't have made a lot of difference to that many people. And she said, there isn't a finite number of healings, and just because you, you've had a healing doesn't mean you've nicked someone else's, basically. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought made a lot of sense. <laughs> but I want to say something about trauma as well, because I must say I've had some massive traumas since I was diagnosed. And somehow I'm still here because I still have my plan and I do it out of bloody-mindedness, if nothing else. So um, within like three years of, of being diagnosed, I lost both of my parents. Uh, my mother died a really awful, um, in, a, in a particularly bad way. 
and uh, I also lost my old mentor of 27 years and his son, who was a great friend of mine. They all died within six months of each other, as well as other things like the house being flooded, then struck by lightning and blah, blah, blah. I know, I know. And I thought I'm, I'm fed up with being a criteria for a crap life because people say, oh, do you know, I had a terrible week last week, but it was nothing like you, though. <laughs> You know, my 11-year relationship ended as well. And, uh, you know, so now I'm doing the whole thing entirely on my own. I went to the, the wall financially too because it's the way that it is. First, I had to spend a lot of money on treatments because you have to pay privately. And my consultant helps me as much as he can with um, blood tests and things because he does it NHS. And I see him on the NHS. But other than that, it's all private treatments. I did basically the Gerson therapy. No, I didn't do several juices all day, every day, because I, I, I don't want to live like that. Simple as that. No, no, I won't. End off. <laughs> but um, I do do juices um, because they just make sense and it's actually quicker than messing around, you know, cooking. I can't cook anyway because I just broke my oven. So <laughs> I can't shut the door on it. <laughs> But I can warm things up in front of it quite easily. <laughs> but it's ever so clean. <laughs> and so if you keep focused, if you have a plan, no matter what you feel like, you can make yourself go through it. Because there are days when you think, Do you know what, I don't know why I'm doing this anymore. I really can't be bothered with it. And also, in it, because I work a lot in the corporate world, when they hear about the big C, which is quite natural because they book a year in advance, for you think, <laughs> although I will say a couple of them, when they heard about it, deliberately booked me for their retreats the following year, just as a show of uh, confidence that I'd still be there. And I suppose if I wasn't, what are they going to do? Sue me. <laughs> Sue me for the <laughs> fee. <laughs> but I have found the whole thing quite liberating in a way because you think, well, you know, it doesn't really matter what you think of me because I could be dead this time next year and I won't have to worry about it. And if you thought bad, you're going to be really upset, aren't you? <laughs> but I, I can honestly say the best thing is, is to really take your time. The mental attitude seems to be everything. That's what it's all about. And if you notice, everyone that's come up here, they've all had different personalities. But they've all learned, and we've all learned, to kind of be a bit selfish and a bit ruthless and put yourself first and for all the people that you think should support you or or would support you and they don't and some of them just completely abandon you you get at least one other person that comes into your life out of the blue that will help you out and that's really the way that it works so it's quite hard at times but it does sort out the dead wood <laughs> But I have to say, one of the lowest points was also one of the highest points when I got the letter from the hospital saying everything's come back normal because he was terrified again because I'd gone on to bioidentical HRT, which is another ball game. I've got lots of friends who are medics, you see. And my consultant said to me, he said, it's completely counterintuitive, you know. And I said, well, I'm still here. And he said, you're like a cat, you are. And I said, what do you mean I'm like a cat? He said, well, he said you know, you you're using up nine lives when other people only have one. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but I'm doing all right so far, aren't I? He said, yeah. So he said, well, look, I'll let you know when I get the, the test results. Well, anyway, at the 29th of February last year, I got the letter to say everything. I'm delighted to tell you everything's completely normal and I'll see you in a year. And I thought, that's what I've been waiting for. And I thought in my mind's eye, that I would get that news and I'm at the hospital with my, who's my ex, but I thought, you know, we'd be together. This was over the years of going through this because it's a slog, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. And um, <laughs> you can imagine it does get on my nerves a bit. But, and I imagined that I was going, we were going to be sitting, who was going to tell me, I go, oh, I'm going to miss you so much, Mr. Kissin, but I'm ever so glad I won't see you for a year and <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And, then we'd go out of there and I'd phone up my parents and then we'd phone his mother and tell him all the good news and then we'd go back to where we live and we'd tell all our friends and everything. But the reality of it was, A, he'd gone, living with someone else now anyway, in Wales, but we won't say anything about that. Love Wales. <laughs> my parents were dead and my neighbours, who were also my close friends, had all moved because they'd all moved on in there. I thought, do you know, I'm like Miss Havisham here and... And the reality, I was, honestly, 
I might as well have been dead because everyone else had carried on as I was. And so there I was, standing in the hallway in my dressing gown, reading this letter, going, yay, <laughs> yay. And I thought, this is not how I imagined it. So you don't really always get what you imagine. And I really took a dive after that because then I had time to survey the damage that had been done. Well, we'd had a, a sports centre that opened up and I spent a lot of time down there. Thank God this Irish woman, this mad Irish woman, opened up a sports centre down the road. And I was telling her I'd only known her about four months and I said, you know what happened to me today? And blah, 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 blah. And I said, so, you know, I'm just standing there in my dressing gown with this letter and that's what it was like. I said, everybody else had gone, you know. I said, I'm like Miss Havisham. And she, but not as glamorous. I was in this old dressing gown and my socks hanging off my feet, you know. And um, anyway, later on that night, I was potting around, still in my dressing gown, and I was potting, doing juice or something or other in the kitchen and all this. You know how you do when you're on your own. Yeah. <laughs> I was, uh, and it was about nine o'clock at night. Well, someone rang my doorbell, and I thought, who the hell's that? And I just said, who is it? And I heard this man's voice. He said, I've got something for Jessica Richards. And I thought, oh, thank you, God. <laughs> so it's what? And I thought, well, who the hell's that? And I thought, what's this blooming horse's head going to come and land on my sofa now? <laughs> so I said, well, who is it? He said, it, it's from Anne. He said, Anne Jordan. And I thought, like, Anne, that's Anne down the sports centre. What's, what's this bloke doing with something from Anne? I opened the door and it was her husband with this massive bouquet of flowers. I could hardly get in the room. And I said, wow. <laughs> Anyway, they say laughter is the best medicine, and it definitely is because it was one of my favourite sayings is that, that, that uh, Mark Twain says, nothing can withstand the onslaught of laughter, and nothing can. And I, I really want to reiterate that about belief as well. I didn't do anything based on belief. I mean, no one's more surprised than I am that I'm still here, you know. <laughs> but all I did decide was what wasn't right for me, and I did have some very profound dreams, and I've, I've put them all in the book just to say how my intuition worked and left me in no doubt whatsoever that the decisions that I needed to make at every step of the way. So I was very confident in what I did because I knew in my heart of hearts I could stare it right down. And my attitude now, you know, kill me or sod off, you know, because... What else are we going to do? I'm not going to do much else about it, so keep on keeping on. So I hope that's been helpful for everyone. I would really like to thank um, Fiona for this brilliant conference, best I've ever been to. Um, also, uh, Robin Daly for Yes to Life. They're amazingly helpful to me. Um, Nadia at the Breast Cancer Haven. God, she was the first person I spoke to that wasn't talking about medical stuff that was accepted. Because if you do alternatives, you'll probably find out you don't get much support or sympathy at all. And there's very little going on for you. They look at you like you're mad and then just say, oh, well, at least yours wasn't very serious, you know. <laughs> you wouldn't want it. And um, <laughs> you have a little non-serious dose of it and see how you feel, you know. <laughs> and... Uh, the Haven was also extremely helpful as well. And uh, Patricia Peet, she is a mine of information. And that's the other thing I would say that is really important to remember, is that when you, when you take the hicks, I think it's like being on the front line, and you never know who's going to get, but you know quite a lot of you are going to get a bullet. You know? <laughs> so it might as well be me as someone else. But um, anyway, I hope that's been helpful to everyone. And... Uh, I hope you never have to find out firsthand, but if you do, it really isn't a big deal. The other thing is, a really important thing as well, is do not get caught up in the story. Just stick to the facts as you know them on the day. That way you keep positive. If you start getting involved in the story, then you start going off all over there. Oh, what if this happens? What if that? What if something else happens? And the army also have a saying for that, the military. They say, if you don't appreciate the situation, then later on you start to situate the appreciation. And that means you start making decisions and then making everything try and fit into those decisions. And th that is really not a good way to lead yourself. And that's, that's all we're doing at the end of the day. So thank you anyway. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>